praise and worship. Amen. God is an amazing God, and it's an honor to get to worship Him. Before we start this morning, we'd like to go ahead and have our uh, kids kindergarten, first and second graders. You may be uh, dismissed with Miss Carrie. She's there in the back waiting on you. And y'all have a great time, and we'll see them here in just a little bit. The rest of us, we're going to uh, get into the Word. Amen? I'd like, to, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 through 24 is what we're going to be reading today. I want to continue on with the idea of for such a time as this. And so, uh, am I on? All right, all right, just making sure. I want to make sure y'all hear me now. I want to make sure y'all hear me. But for such a time as this, as we're looking into what's gone, been going on in our nation and what lies ahead of us, my friends, listen to me, it is such a, in such a time as this, the church must heed the words that we're about to read from the book of James in order to be effective with everything that's going on. Can I encourage you this? We are not to give up. We as the church are not to get to a point to where we feel that nothing we're doing is effective and it's just time to throw our hands up in the air, step back and, and let it go. We are to not give up, and especially as I, if I've even shared with you the, the very first message of this series was that I truly believe that God has placed the church, He has placed you strategically for such a time as this. He has placed First Baptist West for such a time as this. And today, that's what we're going to be looking at. Let's take a look into the Word. James chapter 1, starting in verse 22. Let's all go ahead and stand. And you folks at home, join us as we read the Scripture. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. The Bible says here, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observed his natural face in a mirror, and for, his, uh, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this great time of praise and worship that we have experienced here. And Lord, as I continue now in, in your word, I pray that the sweet spirit would may be maintained. And that, Father, that what I'm about to say will not be my words, but yours. And Father, this message that was prepared is not my message, but also yours as well. And that, Father, the response be from your people as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The title of my message today is Be Doers of the Word. Be doers of the word. This is what God has called the church to be. In a time like this, to do what he has called us to do, to move forward like he has called us to move forward. And so what we want to look at today is how are we going to be doers of the word? And I don't have that clicker. You're going to have to click move for me, okay? Because our, our delay is going on, so I didn't want to have to mess with that. So you'll have to keep up with me uh, the best you can today. But the first thing I want to be able to look at today is that we are to be effective doers, my friends. We are not as a church to step back and to wait and to see what happens and to just fold our hands up and say, we're done, we're not going to be able to do anymore because we are to be effective doers. Now, what does that mean to be an effective doer? Well, the first thing that we have to do and to be an effective doer is that we have to receive the word. Because listen to me, my friends. We can't do what we don't know. If I don't know what the Word says, I can't do it. As a matter of fact, this is our top priority in being doers. The first thing we have to do is receive it. We have to know what it says because it's that Word that permeates in our lives and it changes how we, and it changes how we view things and how we're able to deal with things. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 11 we see this, that the Bible says here that these men were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And so in the book of Acts, we see here the, the effect of, of the word, of receiving the word, that we understand that it changes our lives because the Bible says here in Acts 17, 11, if you look at that, these men were fair-minded. Because what they were doing was they were taking the word and receiving it. They were listening to it. They were applying it into their lives. And so we see then that it also says that they received the word with readiness and searched the scriptures daily. 
So when we're receiving the word, the first thing that we talk about and we look at when we receive the word is we receive it in one instance by hearing it. By you being here today, by you tuning in this morning, we hear the word of God. We hear it preached. We, we, if you were in small groups, you heard it taught. And so we see then that it, one of the things we have to do is we hear it through our sermons and through our Bible studies. And my friends, listen to me. The Bible says that it's imperative that we be here. It says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. Because it's important that we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and that we receive the word. We hear it through the sermon, through the lessons. The second thing is that we study the word. Folks, we've got to study it. You don't just hear it, you study it. You see what uh, what the scripture in Acts that I read, it said that what they were doing was they were receiving the word daily. But then what they would do is they would take what they heard and they would go and they would search the scriptures themselves daily to find out whether the things they were that they heard were so. Over the 10 years that I've been serving as pastor here, over and over and over, I've encouraged you, do not take anything for granted just that I said it. Don't think, well, it's true because that's what the preacher said. Don't do that. Now, I want you to trust me because, believe it or not, I do study the Word, amen? I do plan these sermons out. I do spend time studying and praying and seeking God's guidance. But even with that, I never want you to say, well, our preacher said, No, I want you to do what these men did in the book of Acts, that that it literally changed their mind. They would take what they heard, they would go search scriptures. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to do that because it's not that I'm afraid that you're going to discover something that I missed. It's that I want you to know that you can back up what I say. Because I don't want these to be my opinions. I pray every sermon, Lord, do not let these words that I'm about to say be my words. Let them be yours. Do not let this message be the one that I prepared. Let it be the one that you prepared for us. Because I want everything you find out in Scripture, I want everything that you do when you read and when you pray and you seek the Holy Spirit, I want it to confirm everything that I said during this time. So that you may be doers of the Word, that you can receive it and be an effective doer. But not only that you study the Word personally, but that you hear God's calling on your life. We need to be listening to what God is saying to us. We need to be hearing a call that he's given us. Can I share with you this, that every person that's ever been born has a calling on their life. The very first calling they have is a call to salvation. All of us are called. The Bible says that that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So we have a calling of salvation. You here today, you folks at home, we have that first calling. We need to listen and be an effective doer. So when I hear God's calling, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, or you're watching today and you've never received Jesus into your life, then I want you to understand this. God is calling you to salvation. You need to listen for God's call. You need to listen. But if you're here today and you know Jesus is your Savior, there is another calling on your life, and that is a call to service. Now, that scares the church to death when the preacher says something like that. A call to service. Do you know what that means? It's not that you're called to be a preacher or you're called to be a missionary because that's the first thing that we do is we begin to get worried that, we, that oh my gosh, I don't want to answer God's call because I don't want to go to Africa and be a missionary. I don't want to be the preacher. Listen, you all have a call on your life for service. That service means just serving him. I don't want to ever stand up here too often and say that God wants you to commit your life to him. He wants you to surrender your life to him. Because there's a difference in commitment and, sur- and surrender. When we surrender, when, well, let me say this. When we commit something, have you ever uncommitted? We commit, and then we get tired, and we uncommit. But here's the deal about surrender. When you surrender, you're held captive. You surrender yourself over to Christ. My friends, can I tell you, each one of you here today, each one of you listening, you have a calling of surrender today. Now, as to what aspect of surrender, I don't know. I, to what direction of surrender, I don't know. I will leave that for God to tell you. But my friends, I'm here to tell you, we have a calling and we need to be an effective doer 
We have to be able to hear God's call. Take what we see and what we know about ourselves and then do it. Because God has a a special calling for each one of us. And I'm here to tell you that I know that one, uh, some things that I can look at and say that I'm not called to do that. I, I even told in the first service that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God did not call me to be a worship pastor. Amen? First of all, I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. I can't read music. And I've never been gifted with that ability to even comprehend all that stuff. So one thing I found out, in order to do that job, you ought to be able to do it. But I'm not called to do that. And I believe that each one of us have special callings, and it's between you and God to determine, God, what do you want me to do? What calling do you have on my life? The first one, again, is salvation. The second one is a special service, whatever God wants you to do. So to be an effective doer, we must receive the word. But the second thing that we must do is we must apply the word. Take that which we've heard and make it work in us. Work in doing what it actually says so that we can apply God's word to us. And now I want you to understand, in applying the word, that doesn't mean just hearing it with enthusiasm. It's not just hearing it with enthusiasm, folks. Can I tell you this? You can enjoy every aspect of his word but yet not be changed you can have the wonderful time here today but not be changed you could have sang every song you could just enjoy the message but yet you not be changed at all so it's not just saying whoo i enjoyed that today i got good goosey feelings all over i got warm fuzzies in my stomach and man that was such a great time Woo! i can't wait to be back i'm coming back next week i'm coming to other every other thing that they do because i love hearing that but he says you not be just a hearer but a doer an enthusiastic doer and applying the word as a matter of fact there's two examples that i want to show you the first one is found in the book of mark chapter six now in the book of Mark chapter 6, we have there the idea of Herod and John the Baptist. Now you all know, if you don't know the story of Herod, Herod was married to a woman and his brother was married to another woman. And uh, they, the, the Herod's, Herod and himself got together with his brother's wife and they decided they liked each other. and They didn't want to be married to the others anymore, so they got rid of their husband and wife and they joined together. Now John the Baptist got arrested because John came and said, hey... What y'all just did, that's not good. And that's not what God would want. Now, you would think having somebody right there in front of you telling you that your life is all messed up and, man, you're not following God's direction, you would think they'd go, well, that's enough. John, I don't want to hear any more of that. Now, Herodias, the wife, she said, I don't like that, and she wouldn't listen. But the Bible says in Mark 6, 20, that Herod would call John and he would bring him in and even though, listen to me, John wasn't just sugarcoating it to Herod. He wasn't walking in going, well, there was a guy who did this and this. He would look at him and say, Herod, you are doing this and Herod, this is wrong. This is wrong. But Herod would bring him in continually and listen to him and the Bible says that Herod even heard him gladly gladly he enjoyed how john presented it to him now listen i'm telling you john was good because i don't believe that i could survive standing up here pointing out to you and calling your name out during a sermon amen oh y'all say amen that'd be all right i couldn't get up here and start naming names I wouldn't last long, would I? John preached that stuff to Herod, and Herod said, okay, come on back. But here's the deal. Herod didn't change. He was a hearer of the word. As a matter of fact, he heard with gladness. Now, how you can preach sin and conviction and make it 
sound good where people want more of it. Boy, I need. To, I guess I should have gone to seminary, huh? But we see here that he listened. The second example was in the book of Acts chapter 6. Uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 24, verse 26. And this was with Felix and Paul. Now, Paul was the, the most bold evangelist next to Jesus that the world has ever known. And he was in prison. And he would talk to Felix and do the same thing. He would tell Felix about Christ. He would tell Felix about how they crucified him and how he needed him in his life and how sin was, was running rampant, how the new kingdom was coming. And the Bible says in verse 26 of chapter 24, he sat with him and conversed often. Felix, hearing Paul talk about all this stuff, he kept bringing him back. And having conversations. But again, it didn't change him. It didn't change him. So to apply the word is not just hearing it with enthusiasm, but it's also not just deceiving ourselves either. The second part of that is deceive, not deceiving ourselves. Feeling like we fulfilled the obligation. All in the days of the week, man, we, we've taken care of what we're supposed to do. We've heard the word. We've heard the word. We've heard the word. I've been to church. I've been to church. I've been to church. I've been to Bible study, but having no change whatsoever. My friend, that's deceiving ourselves, thinking everything is good. We look back at Herod, and we look at Felix, and they listen to the convicting preaching of, of, of John the Baptist and Paul, and they walked away thinking everything was still good with them. Rather than letting it be who they were, letting applying it into their life so that it could be who they are. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm 119.11, he says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, because it has changed me. But so often what we do in life is that we want that, that word, we, we want to memorize it, and we think, well, then I'm going to be all right, because when I'm faced with sin, when I've got a situation here that's wrong, I'm going to recall in my mind the scripture, and then I'm going to be okay. I will not sin against God. Now, folks, can I tell you, that's not hiding the word. Just knowing it here in your head is not hiding the word of God. It's I have hidden your word in my heart. What that means is that he has taken that scripture, he has brought it in, he heard it, he studied it, he learned it, he memorized scripture, but he put it into his life and he began to apply it. And here's what begins to happen that he promises us, that the word of the, we've hidden in my heart that we might not sin against God. It's not that when I am faced with sin, I will choose, oh, wait, that's not right, the Bible says this. No, it's what will happen is I will be able to say, I don't want that sin. That's what happens when we hide the Word of God in our heart. We don't want to. The Word of God changes our want-tos. And that's why I believe that a lot of times in churches, Christians can live whatever they want and live like the world and look like the world, act like the world, talk like the world, because our want-tos have not changed. That's why I think so many Christians have a hard time with the idea of falling into sin, because our want-tos haven't changed. Oh, we might have been going to church for a long time. We might have learned a lot of scripture. We might have been going to Bible school. We might have been going to Sunday school. We might have been going to discipleship training. We might have been doing all these things. But folks, what we've done is we've failed to apply it and hide it in our hearts to change our want-tos, because here's the deal. When I'm faced with sin, I will not be tempted by that sin, because the Word of God has changed me, and I don't desire that anymore. That's what application of the word is. That's how I will become a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Man, I'm applying it, and it will literally change who I am. So we look and we see that, to be, that we are to first be an effective doer. We must receive the word, and we must apply the word. Number two on that is now God has called us to be an effective doer by becoming an effective follower. That we'll be an effective doer and then we'll become an effective follower. What that means is that when, where, and how I serve God is no longer up to me. Remember what I told you earlier in the sermon about how there's a difference between committing to God and surrendering to God? When I commit to God, I still want to make some of the choices. 
I still want to know how I'm doing it, when I'm doing it, how I'm doing it. All these things are, are still being left up to me. But when I surrender, I am no longer my own. I have been bought with the price. Now I understand that whatever he wants me to do, wherever he wants me to go, however he wants me to do it, and even whatever he wants me to do, I will do it. Because it's no longer up to me. A verse of scripture that, that came to my mind in the story that I want you to write it down is Luke 9, 59 and 60. Here in this verse that Jesus calls a man and says, hey, come follow me. You know when Jesus said, come follow me, you knew when he meant for him to come follow him? Right now. Right now, at this moment. Come follow me. But in that verse, the Bible says that that man looked at Jesus and said, let me go back and bury my father, and then I will follow you. Now, to us, that sounds like a pretty awesome request. Hey, my dad's dead. We're about to have a funeral. Just let me go to the funeral, then I'll, I'll come. But when we look at this text and we look at what he was really saying, he said, look, folks, listen to me. His dad was still alive and doing well, but he knew eventually his dad was going to die, and once his dad died, then he was going to get his inheritance. Once he got his inheritance, then he would be set. So he said, let me wait until I bury my dad, I get my stuff, then I'll follow you. Different story there, huh? This sounds a whole lot more like us. This sounds a whole lot, well, not y'all. Okay, I've already said I will not put you in my category. It sounds a lot like me. That God, I want to be an effective follower, but when I, and I lay it out there. So, for example, a lot of times we, we talk to our students and the students say, well, I, you know, I'm in school right now, but man, when I'm out of school, when I graduate high school, then I will follow you, God. But, you know, it's tough being in high school. You know, there's this thing God calls peer pressure. And when I get out of high school and the peer pressure is over, that's a joke, right? Because if you're in, high, if you're in school, you realize, and you as an adult know this, peer pressure never goes away. Amen? As a matter of fact, sometimes it gets even harsher and harder to deal with. But we say, as a student, when I graduate, then I will serve you. Then we get out of high school, we get into our college, and we're saying, well, God, you know, I'm trying to get my career going, I'm trying to get my family going, and, and God, when, when I get it all going, and I get my career really going like it should, boy, then, God, I will serve you. Then we get our career going, we have family, and man, family, and, and things get crazy when you get kids on, and, and now you got so much to do, and oh God, you know that I'm so busy now, but when my kids grow up and I get out of all the sports and the, the activities that we're going to all the time, God, when they get out of the house, when things slow down for me, then I will serve you. And then we get all that happening, and then we look around and say, but God, you know, we haven't had this free time in forever. It's time for us to travel. It's time for us to enjoy life. It's time for this. And God, when we get done enjoying the retirement, then we will serve you. Have you noticed that every aspect about this was when I, when I, when I, when I. My friends, listen to me. To be an effective follower, that when, where, how will not be dependent upon us. God, in the very busiest part of my life, I will surrender to you. But we must be an effective doer. Another time is in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 40 and 45. We see here that the nation of Israel uh, had sent out the spies into the promised land. And the spies came back and two of them said, man, it's an amazing thing. Ten of them said, no, there's no way we can take it. And God said, look, I'm sending you over there to the promised land today. And they said, okay, no, we're not going We we can't do it. We're not strong enough to do it today. We can't. And then God looked at him and said, okay, or, or Moses looked at him and said, okay. Then God's told me you can't go to the promised land now. But you realize then all of a sudden what they do, they said, oh, wait a minute. Now we change our mind. Now we're ready. Okay, but we messed up. God, I'm going to go do it right now. 
But you see what happened was they got all the army together and they went out and they went into the promised land. You know what happened to them? I mean, they got, they got their tails kicked, amen? And they came back defeated. Do you know what happened? Was they were trying to choose the win. And so often we do this that we don't want to do something, then, then, then we, we, we experience some difficulties in our lives. Oh, wait a minute. Now, God, I want to go back. Let me go back and serve you now. But again, the when, where, and how is not up to us. They went out on their own and they suffered great defeat. So many times, I believe, my friends, we go out on our own wanting to do what we want, how we want it, when we want it, where we want it, and we don't understand. Where's that fulfillment? But be doers of the word and not hearers only. And I want to close up with this last part is that, that we will be blessed. Look down at verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. Now, let me, let me, let me preface this last point very quickly. I got just a couple of minutes. This in no way, shape, or form am I about to enter into a time of talking to you about name it, claim it, religion. Faith and prosperity, because I don't buy that nonsense. That's not what he's saying here. If you'll follow me, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Because that's not true. I've known a lot of very faithful people in my life, and men, I, they, they didn't have much of anything in physical stuff. But they were faithful to the Lord. I have known very, very faithful people who died of diseases and cancer and other things. And they were faithful. Faithful. They were doers of the word. But yet they still died. So this idea of if you do what God wants you to do, you are going to be blessed according to the world standards. My friends, that's not true. Look at the apostles. Look what they did. None of them prospered in the world. As a matter of fact, all but one died martyrs' death, horrible deaths. But what he was saying here is that if we will be an effective follower, we will be blessed with peace. Because peace will be ours. Not, our, not the world peace, but his peace. That's all the difference in the world, that Jesus Christ's peace will be ours. No matter what we're going through in our lives, we'll have peace. I've often shared many times that for people to make a, a decision for God and to decide which way to go is that when you, make, when you look at it and you look at your decision and you say underneath all the, the worry and the, you're being scared and not sure, underneath it, what do you sense? Do you sense a peace? And if you sense a peace about it, you do it. Because that's the peace that we get by being a follower. So not only peace, but we get direction. So many times, I'm sure over the last couple of weeks, we've all asked, what do we do now? What does the church do now? Do you know what we do? Follow him. Seek him. Follow him and do what he tells us to do. Because he will direct us, man. We, if we don't know what to do, ask him and he will tell us. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He will direct us where to go. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will what? Direct your path. So when we're followers of Jesus, we will have our paths directed. He will guide us. But the last one is the comfort will be ours as well. There will be a comfort. Whatever we're going through, whatever is out there ahead of us, church, listen to me. We don't have to fear what's out there now. We have a comforter that's going to direct us through it and give us peace all the way through whatever's coming our way. We just must take his word and do what it tells us to do. Receive the word. Apply it into our lives. Follow him when and where and how he wants us to. And then know that we're going to be blessed through it. In such a time as this, right here, right now, in the year 2020, with all the craziness of this society and all the craziness of our world, all the craziness of this year, be a doer of the word. Don't just listen to it. 
but apply it. And listen to his call. I'd like you to bow your head as we step into this last time of praise and worship. But before we do, I want you and everyone at home, I want you to, to listen and I want you to understand this, that there is a call that God is placing right now. And if you're here today and you are, are maybe at home and you sense God's calling you to salvation, man, I want you to turn your heart to him right here, right now. You, you don't need anything else other than bringing Jesus into your life. Would you call on his name today and seek forgiveness of sin? Would you come this morning? Each one of you here, each one of you at home, if you need Jesus, man, call on him. If you sense he's speaking to you, call on him. But maybe here you're saying, well, pastor, I know I'm saved. Then I want to encourage you to surrender yourself to him today completely. Say, God, here I am. Wherever you lead, I'll go. Whenever you want me to go, I'll do it. Wherever, however you want me to do it, that's what I'll do. Here I am, Lord. Oh, it's time for the church, for times such as this, to be doers of his word, standing strong. Will you surrender today? Church, Will we surrender ourselves today? Wake up, church, for such a time as this. Father, hear us today. Hear us today, Father. Speak to our heart. Encourage our spirit. Bring those to salvation who need to be saved. Father, I pray that you'll let your church completely surrender to you today for such a time as this that we'll become doers and not walk out of here today and join this service and not having it affect our lives but God that we could be doers of your word God we love you and we thank you my friend in just a moment we're going to ask you to stand if God's speaking to your heart would you surrender to him join us in singing or, or come and pray I'll pray with you or you at home, if you'll just call our, our, our office, someone will be listening. Father, hear us today. Speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll ask you to stand and sing and come forward if God's speaking to your heart.